Brits, mm -hmm. Europeans. Boy, that word of mouth is dangerous sometimes, ain't it? Just like that, one report went out, and boom, everybody on them now. Mm -hmm. Y'all got some who? Y'all know how expensive and how rich gold is to the people? We need that in our life. They need that. Child, they go crazy over some gold. Man. What's good, y'all? It's the Duma Shets Rhea, and we're back with another video. Who we got today, see? Today, we're back with another American reaction. Super excited about this video. If you're new to us, and, and we're new, new to you, you, make sure you scroll down, hit, hit that, that subscribe, subscribe button, button, and turn on the post notification bell because we're, we're on the road to 200k. And we cannot get there without you guys, all right? Join the family. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Australia typically starts on the 26th of January 1788, when the colony of New South Wales was established on the continent. Anyhow, we're not here to talk about boring states, we're talking about Victoria. So it was on the 1st of July 1851 that the colony of Victoria would separate from New South Wales. Situated in the southeast, the colony was already home to many settlements, such as their capital of Melbourne. But in Victoria's early history, Melbourne wasn't the main focus because only a month after the establishment of the colony, gold would be discovered in Ballarat, roughly 100 kilometers out of the capital. Shortly after that, reports came out of Bendigo as well, and just like that, the Victorian gold rush had begun. Mm. Mm -hmm. Brits, mm -hmm. Europeans... Boy, that word of mouth is dangerous sometimes, ain't it? Just like that, one report went out, and boom, everybody on them now. Mm. Y'all got some who? Y'all know how expensive and how rich gold is to the people? We need that in our life. They need Child, they go crazy over some gold. Man. Crazy. Americans all began to flood into Victoria. Mm. The population of the colony before the gold rush sat just shy of 100,000, but by 1861 it would be over half a million. Wow. Mass migration introduced a lot of new ideas and issues into Victoria. Many of the Westerners brought in beliefs of democracy and liberalism, and there would also be many non-Westerners entering the colony. Over 40,000 migrants would be Chinese, and the presence of this many foreigners wasn't so welcome. The gold fields of Bendigo and Ballarat turned into massive tent cities filled with hundreds of ethnicities and languages, diggers from all over the world, now wow. mining into Victorian land. The Lieutenant Governor, Charles de Trobe, would seek to address this issue. However, rather than restricting immigration, it was decided the diggers would be taxed. A mandatory miner's license was introduced in September 1851. Costing 30 shillings a month, it was punishing to diggers. Many had flocked to the gold fields because of the potential for wealth, but a lot of those diggers lived off peanuts. 30 shillings was ridiculous. But regardless, more and more continued to dig, leaving their jobs, their families and their nations to the gold fields. Tent cities turned into towns, and the gold would be finding its way back to the British government and the city of Melbourne. But even with the immense amount of wealth running through Victoria, many diggers continued to struggle, and the Victorian government's treasury was meager. The police would begin to crack down on those digging illegally, operating license hunts on the gold fields. If the digger didn't have their license on them, they'd be subject to a five pound penalty. On top of this, many of the police were ex-convicts from Van Diemen's land. Their policing was harsh, and because they were awarded half the penalty, the system was wide open to abuse. Mm -hmm. Oppressive license hunts became common, and beatings and shootings on the gold fields weren't unheard of. Okay, hold on. Wow. So they mentioned the convicts. Now, we didn't know that history. All we know about the convicts is what you guys have told us in the comment section. Right, right. And no one has sent in a video about the convicts history yet. Mm. Um, so you know yeah. what to do. Got to send that in. We got to have more information on that. You right. know what I'm saying? Because so we can put pieces yeah, together. We're on one side of the field with this one. That's a, yeah. 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 We 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 don't really fully grasp with why they were so um, so harsh. With their policing unless we know who they were yeah. and why yeah. you know in december it was announced the license fee would be raised from 30 shillings to three quid Child, they really it was this announcement it. that brought huh. some diggers to start gathering arms the government quickly backpedaled on its plan but the damage was done as long as the fees hunts and penalties continued anything the government did 
could ignite the powder keg, and it would be in June 1853 that that happened. Licensed hunts would be permitted to be carried out whenever and wherever, and in response, the miners of Bendigo united in the Red Ribbon Rebellion. The diggers opposed to the gold licenses began to associate with the creatively named Anti-Gold License Association. They'd gather in protests across June and July, turning out in the thousands. Their aim was to see the license fee reduced to 10 shillings, and if not, they wouldn't pay at all. They marked themselves with red ribbons, and over 23,000 miners would sign a petition to be presented to Governor Latrobe. The government would react by sending out military to Bendigo, which only agitated things further. And in a protest on the 28th of August, a number of the diggers would clash with the military. Now risking a possible armed conflict. Bro, all those petitions. If it's one thing, all that paperwork is going to add up. I'm just saying. Like, you got all that paperwork that's coming to the to your front door. Mm -hmm. Imagine checking your mailbox and you got straight newspapers. Yeah. And one mail. What you doing all them newspapers? <laughs> Most likely, some people, they ain't coupon or nothing, they toss them into the side. They ain't using it. It's not really much use, you know what I'm saying? But, Lord, all the paper does yeah. add up. One thing you people don't play about is their money. Mm. Okay, and restrictions. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, this, that's why I said this reminds me of the Boston Tea Party. Mm -hmm. All those taxes, and people like, baby, all this tea. Like, all that thing over the board. <laughs> you playing too much. We got some fun. The trope would concede and announced the abolition of the miners' license on the 30th of August. Be that as it may, the Legislative Council would veto his decision and no change would be had. Victoria had become too much for Latrobe. He had been looking to step down since 1852, and his replacement, Sir Charles Hotham, finally arrived in May 1854. Hotham reluctantly took on the post, as he'd have to work a miracle to save Victoria's finances. His military background proved him unwavering. He wasn't going to be one to give in to the diggers. Hotham's first obstacle would be in Ballarat, as on the 7th of October, the miner James Scobie was murdered at Bentley's uh -oh. Eureka Hotel. James Bentley was the prime suspect, but he was quickly acquitted by the magistrate. The diggers were infuriated. They saw this as a quick turnover by a corrupt magistrate. The government took and took from them, and when it came to receiving their rights to protection and fair trial, they'd been robbed. Thousands gathered to protest the magistrate's decision at the hotel. Protests turned to riot. The Goldfield Commissioner Robert Reed and his men were powerless to stop the destruction. Bentley and his wife fled for their lives as the hotel burnt to the ground. Quickly after this, a series of arrests were carried out on the goldfields, and the miners hoped to respond by establishing a diggers' rights society. 10,000 men would gather at Bakery Hill in November that established the Ballarat Reform League headed by John Humphrey. Humphrey was from Wales, where he had been a part of the working class chartism movement, a movement that sought out workers' rights and suffrage. They'd present a series of requests to Hotham and Reed lower the license fees, lower penalty rates, the right to purchase land, okay. and a review of the harsh law enforcement. Hotham would launch a royal commission into the issue, but in contrast, Reed would increase police presence on the goldfield and send for reinforcements from Melbourne. In late November, Humphrey would relay this to the diggers, and the diggers decided to move towards open resistance. A license hunt the next day would be run away by an angry mob, Humphrey couldn't condone these actions, and he was soon replaced by the more militant Peter Laidlaw. Under him, the League took on a military structure complete with brigades and captains. Figures such as Raffaello Carboni recruited the diverse diggers into the movement, as Timothy Hayes and Henry Ross drilled miners in battle form. Henry Ross would present to the League an Australian flag, bearing a blue background adorned with the Southern Cross. On the 1st of December, diggers would take the Eureka Oath at Bakery Hill. They swore by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and to fight to defend their rights and liberties. Miners' licenses were piled and burned as a stockade was built around the area wow. to protect the diggers from the police and military on their way to arrest them. The reinforcements from Melbourne would be at the stockade any day now, and so the diggers stuck by their guns as they awaited the enemy, ignoring Humphrey's calls for peace. However, as the movement had become more militant and more radical, 
it had begun to lose sight. Independence, war and treason was not in the mind of many diggers, and as doubts set in, diggers began to leave the stockade. Those who remained continued to operate as usual. They drank and enjoyed the Saturday night and looked to rest on the Sunday morning, the Sabbath. Spies would relay this to the Queen's forces, and so 250 soldiers and police would approach the stockade at 3 in the morning on the 3rd of December. To this day, it's not clear which side opened fire first, but what is known is the battle was brutal and quick. The less than 200 men in the stockade were overrun in roughly 10 minutes. Many diggers attempted to flee or surrender, but the violence persisted. Henry Ross had been shot dead at the foot of the flagpole, and the Southern Cross flag was torn down. Laylaw had been shot at the arm, and only barely managed to take refuge from the Melbourne forces. The police and soldiers would suffer six casualties to the 22 rebels they had killed, and 114 diggers were taken prisoner. Martial law would be quickly introduced in Ballarat, and armed resistance had been stomped out. Ooh, wait, wait. That, was, that was a lot, boy. That hey, was. First of all, they ran the old boy out of the office and governor. Mm -hmm. It's too much pressure for him. The schedule's petitions added up. <clears throat> Um, but then these new guys came in place, and yeah, it's, that's, that's a lot. They had a whole meeting mm -hmm. where they planned, you know, to protect each other. And the military came in 10 minutes and wiped them out. Jeez. I'm telling you, people don't play by gold. People don't play by money. I mean, the whole, the whole way he orchestrated this video, when he made it plain that they found one goal, one report went out, and then the whole world went crazy. The whole crazy. world. That's crazy. This would be brought to trial in February 1855 and charged with high treason. Of these men were Hayes and Carboni. Through a clever defense team and a lot of positive coverage from the newspapers, the prosecutors struggled to convict these 13 men. Juries were changed, witnesses were called, evidence was presented, but no one in Melbourne would agree to convict these men. The Eureka 13 were all acquitted. Public opinion had wow. turned to sympathize with the diggers, and when Hotham's Royal Commission returned a verdict, it echoed that effect. The gold licenses were abolished, mm. replaced with miners' rights and export fees. Police mm. presence was reduced, and the Legislative Council was expanded to represent the gold fields. Peter Laylaw and John Humphrey would be elected in 1855. The ultimate consequence of the Eureka Stockade had to be in 1856 though. With the creation of the Parliament of Victoria in that year, the Electoral Act was introduced. It mandated that all men, whether landed or not, would be granted suffrage in Victoria. Australia had experienced a revolution, not through force, but through politics. The Victorian Gold Rush had brought in many people from all over the world, all with their own ideas and beliefs and through their shared struggle on the gold fields, their values had become imposed on the colony. The stockade had been a first step for a democratic Australia, but there was still much to do. Women's suffrage was still absent, the Chinese diggers had been rejected in favour of a white Australia, and the indigenous people continued to be without rights or recognition. Australia would have many more obstacles to overcome and challenges to answer in its history, but it all started with the diggers the Victorian goldfields. Wow. Now, one of the fascinating parts Steve. of the diggers was how they found success. Many of the diggers went out to the goldfields on their own, and only through their own determination and the right tools could they strike it rich. These days, it's quite the same. With the amount of startups and freelancers on the internet, a lot of people are determined to yeah. find their own success, but they need the right tools. That's where Skillshare comes in. Skillshare right, is all right about... There, um, what a tug of war. Because yeah. I thought, like, you know, when you're a child and you don't really understand war and politics like that, you see yourself tug war with another individual trying to keep what is yours or trying mm -hmm. to have some of what that person may have because it's supposed to be for everyone to experience. And now you're older and you start to hear these same fights happen in the adulthood and it's more brutal. It's a tug of war, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, but, I mean, this was the beginning of a revolution for them. It may change. You know, so I would love to see more of what came after that. You know, yeah. how they said the Aboriginal people were even without rights. He still mentioned that but one. Yep. These people yep. who left their countries came here, 
fought to, you know, have rights, got it. So I would love to see, like, how that played out with the other groups of people yeah. in Australia. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. we hope you guys enjoyed this video with us. Like this video, subscribe, turn on the post notification bell. We have enabled our super, super thanks. thanks if you like to support the channel that way. As well as our reaction request form is in our description, description box below. below. We'll see you soon. Peace.